Well, what do you think? I don't know. I always uh, feel like it's always after the fact. After the fact? You mean that you get help? Yeah. Did you, did you, um, so did you go ahead and purge? No. Oh, I'm so proud of you. I thought, I was like, oh, she's probably purging right now. No. Well, I'm proud of you for not. So you're right in the middle of just feeling like hell. So when did you plan to binge? No, um, no plan. I don't, I don't well, think. at some at some point you said fuck it. When was that? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, that's your probably. planned binge. That's the binge. That's plan. You planned it. I mean, that's the moment. That's what that is. Um, I left work and I had a chiropractor's appointment, and I've been having a really like. Had hard time, but I, I've just been really uh, questioning, like when am I, like when am I hungry, when am I satiated? Um, I, I don't really know. Um, yeah, well, it's really crazy. hard to tell when you have anxiety about gaining weight, so it makes it almost impossible because your your body is full of anxiety about it. So it's almost impossible to do the hunger scale, which is why I haven't really talked about it with you very much because it's not important right now. You know, the anxiety about gaining weight is far more detrimental and isn't the hunger scale isn't going to keep you from all of that. So it's kind of like, you know, the hunger scale is like trying to fix a massive hole with a straw. Or, um, what's the word? It's, it's like trying to, you know, keep, keep, a, a dam from blowing with a pebble. <laughs> it's not an equal, it's not a good fit, right? We have to diminish the problem to equalize the hunger scale. So yeah, that's going to be very difficult. So anyway, so you were at the chiropractor's office and then you decided I'm going to go get some food. I'm before before the chiropractor, you know, like my belly, I, I had burning sensation in my belly, so it was either indigestion or the fact that I was hungry. Okay, so did you, so, when you texted me, you mentioned the, that your dog was having some issues and... Yeah. Okay, so you... Okay. Okay, so are you not, are you, is that not relevant? Yeah, it's, it's like it's um, that is relevant. Yes. Okay, so that's that's so let's go there because at some point you planned this out. Whether it may not have been like premeditated a ton, but at some point it was planned. Like there was a moment you said, "Screw it, I'm going to get this." And then often people take the hunger skill and say, "Plus, Robin said I should eat when I'm hungry, and I'm hungry." So I don't know if that's the case here. Let's figure it no, out. I had a piece of, um, I was hungry, so I stopped before the chiropractor. I stopped at this belly, uh, and I got a piece of zucchini bread. Good. Okay. And so, at some point, did you feel bad about the zucchini bread? Like you had done something wrong and shouldn't have eaten it? But I always, like, I just feel like I am addicted to the zucchini bread. <laughs> and so, took my hand. That's like, funny. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's erase that and let's go back to at some point, you know, you planned this and you felt like you were hungry and you chose the zucchini bread. So you, you, did you rationalize it and justify it in your mind? Like reason around it because you have guilt about it. You felt like you shouldn't be eating it. Right. So there is shame and guilt and fear about eating it. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so there's your dieting, right? So you're dieting. Let's, I just want you to have yeah, some clarity around it. So that has a lot to do with the fact that you're afraid to gain weight. So there's fear of the body that projects into threatening food, right? And you believe the zucchini bread and the chocolate chip muffins are threatening. Correct? Correct. Yes. 
It's important you see this clearly. This whole idea about addiction is it needs to get out. It's irrelevant and it's nowhere close to accurate. Okay? You're not addicted to them at all in any way. Okay? That's that's gonna cloud your whole thought process around this. If we really look at it, it's not that those foods you believe are threatening. Correct? Correct. So you have shame and guilt about them. So there must have been not just hunger. Well, I believe if you really were hungry, that's great and all. But at some point you may, did you feel pissed off or victimized or vi or in, in some way entitled or justified in taking and eating those foods, even though you felt they were bad? Um, maybe, maybe it was more of a sense of, um, Entitlement. Yes, that's how that comes across. I'm entitled. I deserve because my life oh, sucks. More, more like, more like because I've had like ever since talking to you, like I've been challenging myself and eating like stuff that I don't normally eat. So then, like, like over the weekend, like I bought um like animal crackers. Awesome. Um, so how'd that go? go? Went pretty good. Great. Okay. Take, yeah. take that out of this conversation. I don't think that has anything to do with this. At some point today, you started to feel sorry for yourself. Yes. Okay. That's the problem. Nothing to do with those animal crackers. It has nothing to do with anything that happened this weekend. At some point today, you started feeling really sorry for yourself and then you're pissed and you want to fix it. Right? Am I right? Like, why do I think, like, it was, like, the feeling of, like, well, now I'm okay. Like, now, like, I had a good weekend. I've been doing well, so now I can do this. Like, yeah. I can have this zucchini bread without <laughs> leading to anything more. Well, that's because you didn't, you think it's about the food still, not realizing it's about the victim positionality. So this is your next lesson, okay. and this is what I, why I'm trying to get you to talk about it. At some point today, you felt sorry for yourself. Am I right or wrong? Because I could be wrong. I want you to participate here. Yeah, no, I don't, I just don't know, like. You started feeling bad about life, yourself. You just started feeling bad about yourself. You started feeling like boo-hoo, life sucks. There's something of that essence that happened today. Maybe it was work, feeling overwhelmed. It might have come across as a feeling of I'm overwhelmed. I don't feel capable. No, I think it has to do with this dogs okay so what is the um, let's, yeah yeah okay so, so is that connecting for you like at some point you started yeah. feeling like there's something wrong i can't handle it so maybe that yeah like it's that's like like yesterday like i called on friday i called on saturday for the results and they said they didn't have them yet so then ever since ever since saturday like i mean i he just doesn't seem right he's coughing so I'm thinking, you know, that he, he does probably have cancer and he's probably going to die. And mm -hmm. then, like, then my grandfather just died and then my dog, my other dog just died and now he's going to die. And then... Are you, did you start feeling sorry for yourself? Well, yeah, because it's not about them dying. They, you know, they, they go to a better place, but then it's me who's, like, left here. Okay, so did you start feeling sorry for yourself? I, I know I keep on yeah. repeating that. I want you to really focus on the emotion and feeling that's very specific to poor me. Poor me. Do you recall that feeling? Yes. Okay, that's the problem. Yes, yes. That right exactly. there is is self-centeredism. That's centrism. Poor me. Life's about me. My life is horrible. Blah, blah, blah. Where do you think <laughs> you would go from there? Where, remember when you said, I think it was entitlement. Well, why do you think? Right? You see the connection between the poor me feeling sorry for yourself and then the entitlement as a way to kind of feel better about it. It's Wouldn't you agree? It's like I need to compensate myself for having such a shitty life right now. Right? So the attitude or positionality you have in your reality, right? This is your reality. I'm not saying it's something we should be excited about, but it is the truth. I have a dog. 
I know how loving and how important they are, right? But the problem isn't the actual experience of potential loss of a loved one. It's the fact that you're taking a position of being a victim. So this is, this is the case for every single person I work with with an eating disorder. That's why it's so predictable to me. I don't even need to know. And I'm like, okay, at some point today you felt sorry for yourself. Boo-hoo, woe is me, my life sucks. It happened, right? Once someone takes that position, can you see why in order that, that you're going to find a way to feel compensated? Because I'm a victim. I'm powerless. Are you writing notes right now? No, I'm not. Okay, that's okay. Because uh, I'm recording this and I'll send this to you. I am a victim. I don't like what's going on. I'm a victim and I'm powerless. And I feel sorry for myself. Woe is me. Once you go there, it's not a good feeling, is it? It's like a shitty, it's the terror. It's, 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 it's painful. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So once you go there, can you see why you would try to find a way to, to feel better about it? How can I feel better about this? How can I feel better about this? How can I feel, how can I just get past it, right? Or avoid this feeling? How do I remove it and avoid it? What was your solution? I'm going to get the food. And so do you see what I mean by you planned this out? There's a plan that occurred at some point around it. I'm going to go get my zucchini bread. Those are the bad things that I shouldn't be eating, but this is a special situation and I'm going to go get it. And I'm just going to have one and I'll use Robin's hunger scale and that'll protect me. Can you see why the hunger scale is such an, it's not enough for these emotional issues that you bring to it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so look at it from this point of view. The feeling sorry for yourself aspect of this, like the victim positionality that you're taking and the martyr position, it probably needed a whole loaf of zucchini bread to be compensated. You didn't, but you went to chocolate chip muffins, you went to strawberries and a half a good end smith and two small bags of chips. So that's probably about equal to your martyrdom. Make sense? Is that, is that connecting the dots for you? You got to face these issues or you're not going to recover because you're, you're not really taking, you're not really taking ownership of it. So the first response you had is very common for people who've been brainwashed around the eating disorders, which is to blame the food. I'm addicted to that food. I can't handle it. Right. Yeah. Do you see how inappropriate and short sighted that is? If we look at the truth of what you've experienced, it's really not about the food. It's about you feeling, feeling bad and wanting to feel better. So you're trying to cope. And the way you're coping right now is with food that you've demonized or said you can't have. Which is also another understandable thing, right? People that don't restrict food, do you think their natural tendency when they play, when they're in that victim position or martyr position, is it, is their position to go to food when they want to cope? No, no, no. They're probably more likely to go to something else that they feel bad about. Right. Whether it's like, I want to go shopping. So they'll have some other impulsive compensation that they need to control. Right. So, or alcohol, right. Something they feel bad about that they need to control. They're more likely when they feel this position of powerlessness and my life sucky sucksness is to want to compensate themselves with something they feel deprived of but want. So we both know you want and like that zucchini bread and the chocolate chip muffins. But why do you have to be in a dark victim position to eat it? Well, because you've demonized it as a threat to your thin thinnerness, right? Are you tracking with me right now? Me, me? Okay, good. Good. So first thing, I don't want you to feel bad. 
I don't think you've done anything wrong. I just think this is the perfect opportunity for you to see everything more clearly because you're in it. Don't you agree? We're not recalling it. You're in it. So it's right here. It's right now. So how do we solve this? Well, we got to ask the question around why are you feeling victimized? Is it because you don't think you can handle it? You know, where is the powerlessness coming from? Is it because you think that it's um, more than, you know, do you feel sorry for yourself because you think this is, no one else has this issue? You know, I'm just throwing things out there. So I want you, I need you to really think about it. Is it all of what I said or what is it? Yeah. Well, you know, that right there, what you just said comes from being a victim of yourself. So do you see how you're feeling sorry for yourself? Is that going to help anything? Does it, I mean, think about the outcome of feeling sorry for yourself. Does feeling sorry for yourself, is it going to promote any change? Totally. So you're going to have to change your perception about this. You can't keep on thinking like this. So the victim positionality is one of the most important aspects of an eating disorder. Meaning you're going to have one if you stay a victim. So we have to look at, are you really a victim? If you can handle this, right? Are you a victim of reality, life? You know, should you expect that your dog is going to stay alive forever to protect you from your sense of, yeah, it's going to happen. You know, um, I think, um, death is an important part of this conversation too. Don't you agree? This whole thing is based on your fear of death, you know, cause to you being, being fat is equal to death. And so you're so afraid of it that you're doing all of this impulsiveness, right? So it really comes down to fear of death and the fear of death of everything around you. But ultimately, isn't that reality? So maybe your fear is reality. You know, reality of being, being alone, reality of breaking up with your boyfriend, the reality that you're going to, you might have a, a beloved pet that's going to die early of cancer. That is, you know, I know when you got your dog, you knew that ahead of time. Not that you knew that exact outcome was going to happen, but the fear that your, 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 your pet that you love and are dedicated to might die early. That's something, don't you agree? You kind of are, have to accept early to get one. Am I wrong? Yeah. So the question I want you to ask yourself is this, uh, is this something that you can handle? without feeling sorry for yourself. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, I knew that was going to be your answer. Cause the I think what we have to look at is why do you feel sorry for yourself? What is it that would promote feeling sorry for, for, for someone, for, for, for someone to feel sorry for themselves? What would promote that? Um, I think for some people, so anybody feeling sorry um, for themselves. So you, like for me, I guess would be like, we're kind of like what you just said, where I'm still not facing reality. Yep. I would totally, well, I'm still in denial. yeah, like what you're, yes, you're in denial in an, another way of thinking about this, Nina is 
you want something other than reality. So you have these expectations or beliefs and fan you can call them fantasies if you want even if they're not far-reaching fantasies they're fantasies because re as reality unfolds like when you have if you look at a book okay here's the book you don't necessarily know what's going to happen until you turn the page right so what you're doing is you're saying this is how I want this book to read and it better do exactly what I want oh shit this page doesn't meet my standards poor me I'm reading a book that doesn't read the way I wanted it to see how that works yeah you have some fantasy expectation of what life's supposed to be like and you're gambling with horrible odds but not realizing it you know so we have to look at your past and I want you to address how much your life has not turned out the way you imagined it, it would? A lot. So have you ever thought that maybe your imagination is sucky? No, that's not you, but because in general, it's not you that's really creating the imagination. It's the programming that tells you what to expect. Am I, does that make sense? Because you can say, yeah, I imagine myself getting married in this white gown. Oh, well, who told you that? You didn't create that. Make sense? So it's programming that you've internalized as like something you want. And then it's not necessarily happening like the program told you it would. And you feel sorry for yourself, not realizing that you're the one that committed to that programming. And you're the one who's feeling sorry for yourself that the program sucks. So is it your life that sucks or is it all these expectations that sucked? The expectations. You got it, dear. You got it. Amen. It's the expectations that suck. Not your current life. Your current life is freaking awesome. You're just made to think it sucks because you expect this like, like I'm going to win the lottery type of fantasy to occur, not realizing that what you've been sold is a fantasy. There is no guarantee when you get a dog that it is going to live a fabulous life until it's 18 years old. Or yourself or your kids. There's no guarantee of any of it. I think that's the one thing. Don't you agree with kids? When you have a baby and it's sitting in front of you, don't you agree? That's the one thing that you, when you realize, holy shit, this could kill me. Yeah. I know. So you, why gamble with the idea nothing wrong is ever going to happen? You've got to go into the space that everything wrong is going to happen and it's worth it. It's worth it to experience reality, to be here, to participate. You have to be open to infinite problems that will occur. If you're open and okay with infinite problems and you don't expect fantasy perfection, what happens to this victim, poor me state of mind? There's no reason to go there. Huh, I know. And all of a sudden, your whole entire perspective is one of gratitude and acceptance, right? And adaptability. So when something happens, you go into, okay, here's what's going on. What can I do? Where am I limited? And when do I have to accept what's going on? Because it's out of my control, right? So do you see how being in that space allows you to adapt? And move, adapt and move, adapt and move and adjust. Versus being paralyzed by your like, what the hell? This isn't what I wanted. Poor me, my life sucks. I got to find a way to entitle myself to feel better about it. You know, and so now you have all these coping mechanisms that cause their own issues that you're also adding to your bullshit, shitty ass life. Right? So that's where it compounds. Because now you have coping mechanisms to deal with your poor me victim positionality that you don't want consequences for. So underneath all of this, 
And this is awesome because I think this is the first time we're having this conversation, you know, and it's about, and you're in it so we can talk about it. And it's much easier for you to see is the position that you feel victimized by life in general. And it's because you hold these fictitious fantasies that are all our illusions about what life should be like. I thought life was supposed to be this way and life was supposed to be that. Well, when did you think of that? When you were 12? Before life, oh, life. right? <laughs> it's like, no, those are fantasies. I see this commonly with people who come from poverty yeah. or a state of lacking. So they don't have to necessarily have poverty but they come from a position in their mind or their parents did and they were lear they learned this that they are lacking. They don't have enough and other people have more. Does that sound reminiscent of your history at all? Um maybe more so when we came to this country. Um not so much. like it go it was more of um there was a lot of like um there was a lot of uh, drinking and physical abuse and molestation. Mm -hmm. So, like, my fantasy, like, you know, like, I knew, like, my family always used to say that I lived in my own bubble, but it was my way of escaping mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. all of that. And um, we were definitely better off financially in Korea than we were here. So... So when you came here, do you think that maybe in your mind you it, you felt that you were lacking here compared to what you were witnessing? I suppose. Well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm throwing it out there. I'm trying to help you process. So I could be wrong. Yeah. So yeah. Something, to, something for you to look at. Not that that's important. Either way, you're in that state now. Where it started is, I think, irrelevant, but it does help to go, oh, yeah, I do remember that. And I do feeling like, well, I'm going to prove myself. So that's when these fantasies start to go up because you're trying to prove yourself better than your reality. Lacking, okay, maybe it was more like, I guess I was associating like lacking like with financial more than lacking not being good enough to like my mother. All of it, like, lacking. I don't have yeah, what they have. I don't have opportunity. I don't have enough um, inadequacy. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not like. Not smart know, enough. Yeah. yeah. Is that connecting the dots for you? You getting a ding, yeah, ding, ding, yeah, ding, ding. Yeah. I think we hit it. Okay. So what happens when you feel that way is naturally your it, your instincts as an animal to survive would be well we have to make it better. So we go into this like churning, like what's going to make it better? What's going to make it better? And we typically glom on to social ideals that are like very fantasy oriented that are glamorized. I'll get that. And that will make everything better because it's glamorized in your mind. It's like fantasized, but it seems somewhat reachable because that's how the media portrays it. It's reachable and normal. So you do that, but you don't realize when you're attaching to those glamorized ideals that you're gambling with a very, very, very low likelihood you'll get it. But even if you win the lottery and you get that, it does not remove your internal sense of inadequacy. It's an object or a, a t acquirement, right? Like you've been thin, but did it ever fulfill your sense of inadequacy? No. If it did, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be so paranoid about losing it. The the weight, the thinness, right? Yeah. So you're constantly feeling inadequate anyways, and then if you regain weight, it's like proof that you're inadequate, and then it's worse to regain. You know. So again, what you're doing to try to feel adequate is directly causing harm to you. It's kind of like if you look at it like war, your, your, the weapons you're using that you think are helping defend you actually turn against you at some point and cause massive amounts of damage to you, even though you still believe the illusion 
that it's going to help your life when you look at your life and you go, this is extremely damaging. You know, you perceive it as, as armor when in reality it is a dagger cutting your throat. So let's go back into the, the root of this one here. The root of this issue is that you feel sorry for yourself, right? Obviously, there's a seed for why you feel sorry for yourself, which to me is the fantasy that you you hold your life to. Fantasy that your dog's never going to have problems. Fantasy that you're never going to have problems. That every job is going to be perfect. And some of those fantasies, I do believe, stem from the inner core of the seed, which is you do not feel competent or capable within yourself. You are lacking these, what you what you are lacking, if there is lack here, is confidence in your ability to live, to be alive, to actually experience the evolution of life, which requires death. There must be a winter to experience summer, and you're expecting to never experience those winters. You're afraid you won't survive them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So when, you, so when you feel sorry for yourself, you're feeling sorry for the fact that you have to experience life. And all of it, and you're bitter about it, you know. And so that positionality to life has to be adjusted. And the way we adjust it is by one You've got to look at a sense of capacity. Can I handle it? Is it worth being alive for? Because you're alive for it, whether you like it or not, is it worth it? Can you accept that? Can you accept death as part of life? That's a big one, don't you agree? Yeah. So if you want to if you want to be present with your dog, you might want to accept its death. Ahead of time. Same with your kids. Same with your job. Same with your body. Same with everything that is worldly, you know. You go into accepting it. And you accept it by getting a sense of capacity to handle it. Can I handle that? Can you handle your dog's death? And I say that by with without feeling sorry for yourself. Can you handle your dog's potential death, whether it's now or in five years or whatever, without feeling sorry for yourself? I want to. Okay, that's good. That's good. So what would it take, right? So remember, did we go through the experience of exposure and people saying you're fatter? Did we go through that embarrassment? Okay, you remember how you went through that and you're like, oh, I could totally handle that. Okay, this is similar. Can you handle the loss of a loved one? What I mean by handle is accept. Can you accept the loss of a loved one? Okay, so I'm going to keep on asking it. I get that you want to, but you need to go in and actually ask yourself if you could. So what the way you way you find out is you go into it in your mind as if it is happening. Okay? So that I think that's might be where you're getting um you're you're stopping in this is you're saying I don't want to look at it, but I I I I want to. <laughs> but if I look at it, it's going to be painful. Well, Let's do it. This is what this is what I'm here for. Go. I want you to imagine that your vet is going to call, and we're just going to give it the worst case scenario. Your dog has cancer. It should die within days. They think you should put it down. You're going to put it down this weekend. Let's do it. Okay. Of course, that's so sad. Of course, you're going to be heartbroken. Of course, it's going to be painful. And there's loss. 
right? What happens the moment you accept that as the, the end of his chapter in your book? Or hers. I don't know if it's boy or girl, but... Yeah. He's gonna, he has a chapter in your life's book. And this is where it comes to a close. Are you going to be okay with that? Do you feel like you could move forward? Doesn't mean the chapter is... You can't... You know, just means that this part of your, your connection with this other animal is coming to a close. How do you how do you feel about that? It hurts. That's that's normal and I think that's okay. That's not something we need to remove. It's painful to have loss, right? Or the end. There's an end here. What happens once you get past the loss? Because loss does move transition. There is an evolution to loss. What happens after that? I want you to stay in that. This is the end of the chapter with this dog in your life's book. Remember, there's a big book here, and we're, we're now closing this chapter with the dog. Life goes on. And how do you feel about that chapter? You pissed Life about it? Up. You feel sorry for yourself because of that chapter? No. Oh, see, does, do you hear how ridiculous that sounds now? <laughs> it sounds really freaking dumb. So what's now how do you feel about that chapter? I feel okay. I feel grateful. Yes. Honored. Right. So special. It's like beautiful. It's a beautiful chapter, right? Isn't that wonderful? And the gratitude is magnificent. It's massive, isn't it? It's almost undescribable the gratitude you do you have for that chapter. It's like what a what a gift. That was a gift. And you know that dog has a book too and you're in its chapter, you're in its book and it feels the same way, doesn't it? Okay. Can you handle that? I know you can. In fact, aren't you grateful? Notice how it changes from poor me to I'm so grateful. I am so grateful. So much gratitude and love that is I can feel and experience and share. And it's beautiful. It's sacred. It is a sacred relationship. Do you see how that this it, there's a transformation when you go into accepting the end of it? I want you to I want you to think about what happens when you accept accept reality here. What happens when you actually can accept it? What happens to that feeling of poor me when you go through acceptance? What happens to that self-centric poor me? Oh, it just, you, you become grateful. It shifts to gratitude. You went right there. I'm so, you're, you're in this with me. You're doing a good job. Went right to gratitude. Which one would you rather feel? Sorry for yourself or gratitude? Right. And don't you feel it? It actually brings you even more connected to your the beloved animals that we have sacred relationships with. You you end up feeling even more connected as animals together. You become an animal with them. You know, there's something something really beautiful about it to me. I think the, the illusion is that when you feel sorry for yourself or you become a victim, that it's going to actually do something. 
positive. You know what I mean? Yeah. And really, it just keeps you disconnected. And that's what you experience is disconnection. Right? And that's what you're afraid of is disconnection. But when you actually go into accepting reality, you're so connected. You're so connected. And it's so beautiful. So to someone who's really connected, death is is obviously painful. My mother just died, you know, a little over a year and a half ago of cancer. It was terrible. I feel so connected to her. I felt connected to her as she was dying. And the chapter that she played in my life was so sacred, right? Why well, I feel sorry for myself. Do you see how um, small that perception is compared to the small of being pissed off about it or feeling victimized of it or feeling sorry for yourself? How small and diminishing that would be of my mother. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm not grateful for what I got. I want you to go ahead. Go. I need you to go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm listening. I feel like that's um, the same way I am in my relationship. Yep. Um, right now, uh, with a very, very loving, patient, and understanding man, but mm. he's going to school to be an English teacher, so he's not in the best financial situation. So, so I feel sorry for myself a lot. Like or that sense of entitlement, like, I have my life in order. <laughs> and, and here I am, like, you know, like, I can't eat, like, we can't really go out to eat <laughs> as much as I would like to. We can kind of, like, I eat. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm glad you're yeah. kind of giggling about it right now. Like, what are you, what? <laughs> So I, I was just going to tell you when, when you were beginning to talk is that this is the core of your eating disorder. Poor me. That is the core of it. The One of the main roots of it. Yeah. So if yeah. you want to recover, you're going to have to start at the, at, at the seed, rip the seed open and go into the center. And ask, am I capable of living life and all of its baggage? Do I, am I okay that pretty much nothing's going to go right? And what is right anyways? And who the hell is telling us what right is? Because ultimately, everything has gone right in your life. It just is made to seem wrong because there's a fantasy that you're holding it to. And that fantasy is actually causing all this disconnection and feeling poor, poor about life. And not really appreciating. It's kind of keeping you from gratitude. Gratitude is, didn't that feel good when you were talking about the gratitude you'd have for this animal? Didn't it feel good? Isn't that what really what you're looking for? Is that feeling It's a beautiful feeling. It's very hard to describe other than I feel grateful. But isn't it just massive? Wouldn't you rather that than go back into what it feels like to feel sorry for yourself? Me, 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 dad, you know? So disconnecting. Oh, yeah, I, can, I can go back there. And, so and narcissistic. So <sighs> self-centered. So completely delusional. Right? You're going to have to grow up. You're going to have to... You're going to have to... <sighs> mature. Right? I think... I think what this is going to take for you is just recognizing that the way you fantasized life as a child and as a teenager is as an adult. 
Well, it carried into your adulthood. This is very juvenile, so this isn't something that you created in adulthood. It was created in a juvenile state of mind. Okay. Right? As an adult, is this something you would teach your teach uh, people? That way, no. I know. So it's not a, your current wisdom is aware this is not, nor, this is not, I don't want to use that word. This is juvenile. But for some reason, you're just carrying it into your adulthood, even though your adulthood and your wisdom says, this is, I don't like it. This sucks. I don't want it. But you're holding yourself to this juvenile fantasy of what life's like. And now you're an adult and you're like, clearly what I fantasized was so naive. That's not how life works. There's infinite influence on your outcomes. There's an infinite influence on the environment. There's infinite reasons why your dog might have cancer. It's infinite. Can't control it so much. And if you want to control it, that takes over your entire awareness, right? You don't get freedom. You're a slave to whatever you're afraid of. That's all you think about, right? Oh. oh, gosh. I feel like shit. <laughs> aren't, aren't you glad? I'm like, oh, God. Poor me. <laughs> Poor me. I should go get a zucchini braid and a chocolate chip muffin and some strawberries with condensed milk and two oh, small bags of chip, God. and I'm going to blame it on addiction. Never mind the fantasies that make me feel that my life sucks. And then the fact yeah. that I'm a victim and feel sorry for myself. And that from there, I feel entitled to all sorts of self-abuse that I'm complaining about. God. I know, I'm such a bitch, right? My God, Robin, you should know. You should know. I, I, I deserve to have a big house, a nice car, <laughs> and a fucking breeze. Right. You know? And you're supposed to have, yeah. like, a big ass and a small waist and big boobies and perfect hair. And you should never age. And you shouldn't have to work. Should never die. <laughs> no, no, your dog shouldn't die. You're special. It's funny. I'm glad you're laughing about it. It's time to remove the fantasies that stemmed from childhood. They're not helping you anymore. Those fantasies provided you a coping mechanism as a child. Your bubble. That bubble sucks when you're an adult, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's great for a kid that needs to find a way out in their mind. It worked beautifully. Yeah. And you can have gratitude for it. But let me tell you, that fantasy caused a lot of damage over the course of your adulthood. Yeah. yeah. And here's the thing. If you had to go back to your childhood, do you think you could handle that and you, you, you could handle it now differently? Well, if I could go back, yeah. <laughs> I don't, the if, knowledge I have, absolutely. Right. So would you need to have such a hardcore coping mechanism if you could go back? Don't you agree, though, having perspective um, as an adult of your, you know, of Peru, its culture, it's what's going on and what was going on at the time that you would forgive it a little bit? You'd give it a lot more grace. Yeah. Right. You wouldn't take it as serious either. You would obviously not want to stay, but, you know, I wasn't there. So I don't, I don't have that. Um, you are the only one that can experience it differently in your mind because you experienced it as a child with a child's perspective. And you don't have any alternative, which is why those coping mechanisms are really important for children. But unless you can go back and recontextualize it as an adult, you're going to have to hold on to those childish coping mechanisms. So now that you're an adult, you really do need to kind of go back and forgive it. 
look at it and go, oh, you know what, I wouldn't take it so serious. And as soon as I could get out, I would, I'd be grateful. I'd have gratitude. I close that chapter is over and you are in the, you have lost Peru. You want to say that you lost your Peru that ended in chapter two. Do you see how we can readjust your, your history? We're not changing your history. We're changing your perception of it. Yeah. How important do you think that is in your recovery? No, it's extremely important. Yeah. Like I'm still like, I'm like 38 years old and you know, I was 12 years old, but I'm still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're responding to her perception of it. And that's where you could say, well, at 12, my perspective at 12 years old was this, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So what I'm doing actually makes sense to a 12 year old who's uh -huh. agreed. Agreed. So do you see how this is? To me, it's not bizarre. You're not doing anything wrong. Everything should kind of line up looking back and go, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not crazy. I'm not disordered. I don't have an illness. I'm still coping as an adult. And it sucks. <laughs> and I hate it. And so I just have to go back. I need to retell the story. You know, maybe your next chapter or this chapter we're in is I got to retell what happened in chapter one. Now that I'm an adult, I'm going to tell it differently because the way I told it, I didn't have a sense of capacity. I have a sense of I can handle this now. If I had to go back, if I could go into that first chapter and talk to that girl, oh, hell yeah, I could get through it. And I wouldn't need to cope the way I did. Am I making sense to you right now? Or am I just like uh, out of the clouds? No, no, you're, you're making sense. But, you know, like physically I'm hurting right now. <laughs> That's okay. You, the physical pain that you're in from your planned binge because you felt sorry for yourself. Okay. Is actually going to help us with what we've been talking about, which is it's time to accept. It's time to accept that if, if you keep on thinking this way, if you keep on feeling sorry for yourself, you're not going to escape this. Right? Because don't you agree the way you ate today is because of that feeling sorry for yourself. And yeah. it's because you thought in your head, I'm going to purge, I'm going to diet tomorrow. I, I know that for sure. That's a guarantee. Yeah. And yeah. so, so I, I guess what I'm wanting you to see is if I don't change this way of thinking, I can't escape this horrible jail cell. I have to diet. Because I eat to compensate for my bitchy ass attitude that comes from a 12 year old entitled little bitch, right? I say that with compassion. So do you see the connection between your, that attitude and how, what, what has to change, you know, what's underneath all this is, you know, bitter. It's a position of being a victim and being pissed about it. So you got to change yourself yeah. from being a victim and say, you know what? I can handle it. So I'm not a victim and it is forgivable. I could handle this. I could handle it. If I could go back, I have, I could really handle that better. I wouldn't um, take it so personally. It had nothing to do with me. Being molested had nothing to do with you. Being in a, a country that was not doing well is nothing to do with you. None of it had anything to do with you. There's nothing wrong with you. That's kind of a big deal, don't you think? Yeah. 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 So do you need to prove your life is better than it really is at this point? Mm -mm. So do you, so the thing I want you to commit to, or at least I'm going to recommend, cause you're going to do what you're going to do no matter what, but do not fix what just happened. Do not fix it. If you fix it, 
what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just stuck in it. Yeah, you're kind of just, you just kind of like press that cycle forward again. It's almost like you just gave it some power. You just gave it gas. So it's going to keep on going. Do you want this to die or not? I so just don't fix it. So where this takes us now is into that space where I said, you're going to have to feel your fat. Remember that's where we left off. Lay down. That's okay. where we left off in our last session. You need to, and you know, I want you to feel it grow because I do believe that what, what you just did with food is forgivable. It was your child. It was the 12 year old. Okay. And instead of punishing her, you need to talk to her. You need to talk to her about, I understand you didn't think you could handle that, but you know what? You did. You did handle it. You can totally handle that. If it happened again, you could absolutely handle it again and you would handle it better. So not only do you have the ability to do it, you have a better ability to handle it. If you can Bye. handle if you can handle that, what can't you handle? Yeah. You can handle gaining weight right now. Oh. Is what happened today forgivable? Yeah. yeah. Right? Is it really that yeah. is it really that catastrophic what happened today? No, but I know. that shame and guilt. Well, that's yeah. why I asked the question. Your shame and guilt comes from thinking it's a catastrophe, doesn't it? Yeah. Is it really worthy of shame and guilt when you look at the underlying issues we've been talking about? Is your response really worthy of shame? No. Mm -hmm. It's worth of compassion and totally. love and support. Yeah, and I'm and and really, is this is this the first time you've heard of this? position where this, you, um, have you ever been given this type of perspective? No. So does it make sense that you feel bad that you didn't sense. know this? No, you're just now hearing a totally different way to look at things. And it certainly gives you like, Oh, what I was doing is really understandable. And no wonder I'm miserable. Okay. All right. Do, do you get a, can, can, don't you agree you deserve a moment of grace? Don't you? Is it really ca catastrophic that you had a day like today? Or do you see like this was what was going to happen? If you didn't have this conversation, this was inevitable. In our work together. Yeah, yeah we're talking like in the last five months, never mind the time before, but in the last five months that I've uh, been like this, like as we're talking, like those days of memories are flashing by and it's like, oh, now, now it makes sense. Yeah, um, I know. You're like, oh, I just, you never really had the opportunity to open it up and get distance from it, to see it from a distance. And that's what I, that's all I'm doing right now for you. It's going, okay, let's get some distance. Feels good, doesn't it? So by not, by not fixing it, you mean? No, like wait. Not throwing up. Yeah. Not exercising and not starving tomorrow. No, you haven't done anything wrong. There is no reason for you to fix it. And your body can handle it. Your body will have its own adjustment to it. You don't need to fix it. Your body can handle this. Why would you need to come in and, and fix it? I know. My body's not very happy right now. <laughs> That's okay. It, it is capable of handling this. You just have to yeah. look at how this came to be. And uh, the other thing is, would you have had a day like today if you didn't tell yourself ahead of time, I'm going to fix it? Yeah, no. I no. know. Yeah, I know. You committed no, to it. No. You planned it out. So don't 
you don't need to fix anything. That's the thing. I know that there's probably remorse over what happened today, meaning, crap, I wish I would have talked to Robin before we did it. But you needed to have this experience for us to have this conversation. So if you swoop in and try to fix this, you're not facing what I've been asking you to face in the first place. Yeah. There's no reason for you to fix this. You do not need the pendulum swing to swing the opposite extreme direction. You haven't done anything wrong. Your body can handle this. The last thing you need to do is go back into some form of purging that is going to promote another binge later on. Because you will binge again if you go back into dieting. Yeah. You will. So it's like, when do you stop? When does it stop? Well, it stops right now. If you can stop right now and accept this, this, this is right now is the best opportunity to recover. Not after you purge. I know that's probably what you're thinking. Well, I'm just going to purge this up and then I'll, then I'll accept it. No, you're not accepting it. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. That's why. You don't. That's why I reached out. Yeah. I knew that if I reached out, then I knew I wasn't going to do it. Yeah. How does it feel to know you don't have to fix this? It's not your deal. Don't worry about it. The body yeah. can manage okay. this. It's going to work itself out. It's going to. It's Trust me. It's going to work itself out, and it'll find its own equilibrium from it. What you need to focus your energy on is what we've been talking about, which is the cause. The entitlement. That entitlement to that food was enabled by your dieting, number one. But the entitlement was caused by your feeling sorry for yourself. Again, does it is it clear to you right now what's underneath it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to stop recording. I'm going to upload this and resend this to you. You need to listen to this like three times. Because yeah, I think it's going to, like, click. Holy shit. Yes. Oh, my God. And, you know, it's, this is really key here for you in your recovery. Both of these. Not just looking at the cause, but not doing anything about the outcome. Okay. The way you were looking at it is so understandable. And that's, it, it's understandable why you would binge, especially thinking that you could diet it off. All of it should make sense. Like we just witnessed the whole process from beginning to end. The difference right now is you're aware, you're seeing it from a distance. And if you don't do anything to fix what happened, tell me how that will feel. Well, physically, <laughs> um, uncomfortable, but it will pass. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, like, I don't know, like, I feel like if I don't do anything, then, then it'll just pass. Yeah, you haven't done anything yeah. wrong. Yeah. Do you understand why I say that? Yeah. Because what you've done makes sense based on this 12 year old yeah. perspective and trauma. Yeah. You haven't done anything wrong. Plus is it again, it goes back to, should you feel shame about eating zucchini bread? Really? No. Right? None of this is worthy of shame. None of it. Yeah. You haven't killed anybody, Derry. This isn't cat catastrophic. Nothing catastrophic has happened. Basically, what has happened your whole life just happened today. <laughs> Another round of the same shit happened today. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, you're going to have to stop. 
And the beauty of you having gone through all of this today, it allowed us this conversation for you to say, stop, I'm not doing this anymore. There's no, first of all, there's no reason for me to feel bad. And there's no reason for me to fix this. The body's going to fix this on its own. And I'm going to recover my soul here. Yeah. Yeah. So you feel like you can handle that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome.